once very early in my career as a meditator, soon after I'd met a John Fu, I had a dream. In the dream, I was visiting a John Lee's monastery. I had never been there, but in the dream, they had this big museum, several stories high. And there was the choice to climb the stairway or to climb a ladder up on the side of the building. And in the dream, I chose the ladder. I wanted to go straight up to the top floor. And as I was climbing, the ladder fell down. Fortunately, I was caught. But the problem was the ladder wasn't leaning against anything solid. And at the end of the dream, I found myself at the door having to contemplate going up the stairway. That's when I woke up. And that's pretty much a story of how my practice started. A lot of things happened very fast those first couple of weeks with the John Fu. And then they all unraveled. And I had to start back at the beginning, step by step by step. This can sometimes be discouraging. It happens to all meditators. Sometimes, by fluke, we happen to hit something that's very advanced, or seems at least seems very advanced in the meditation, and then it all unravels, which can be encouraging, but it also can be discouraging later on, as we see what we're actually living with in our minds, that those quick, flashy experiences didn't really that make that much of an impact on the mind. And the work that does have to be done to follow up seems a lot less glamorous. A lot of people give up right there. But it's important that you don't give up, and also that you don't look down on the situation where you are, don't get discouraged. Because wherever you are, that, those are the issues you have to deal with. That's a situation you have to deal with. And if you don't deal with it now, you come back to that same situation all over again, and sometimes worse. So the proper attitude is that whatever the issues that arise in meditation, those are the ones you've got to deal with. And you don't compare them with the issues you would like to be dealing with, or the ideas of where you would like to be in your meditation. You just like, like to be magically beamed up to some higher level of concentration or a higher level of insight. It's often our refusal to look at the situation in our minds right now is what's preventing insight from arising, preventing concentration from arising. So look at what you've got. Look at where you are. And don't pass judgment as to whether it's an elementary problem or a more advanced problem. It's the problem that you're facing. It's the problem that has to be dealt with. And bring all your powers to bear there. And be glad that you've got the opportunity. Don't view it as drudgery. A lot of people are in situations where they have no inclination, have no even idea what the practice is about. Or they may have an idea and they may have an inclination, but they don't have the opportunity. We here have the opportunity. We've got the inclination. We have some idea of what it's about. And the opportunity is all here. These are opportunities that are rare to find. So the teaching on contentment means, on one level, or the teaching on acceptance means accepting where you are. It doesn't mean that you accept that you're going to stay there forever but simply accepting this is the situation you're facing in a meditation, whether it's one you like or not, whether you find yourself attracted to it or not. That's not the issue. The issue is, are you willing to work with what you've got? That willingness is an important element in all levels of practice. It starts with our willingness to help other people and goes on through our willingness to practice the precepts. This volunteer spirit is an important part of the practice, because that's what it's all about, realizing that you've got to put the energy in if you're going to get anything out of it. And you're willing to take that first step, make that first gift of your energy. And from there the practice grows. Without that attitude, it doesn't go anywhere. 
or we can think of as what we'd like to get out of the meditation. But before you can get anything, you have to give. And as with generosity, sometimes people look at what they've got and they, it's not what they would really like to be able to give. They'd like to be able to give much more. They'd like to have a more impressive offering, but their means are limited, so they have to content themselves with giving limited gifts to begin with. But the momentum builds on that. And sometimes it's the little gifts that bring the greatest reward. And John Fuang used to like to tell the story of a man and his wife who had only one, one cloth between them. They both had a cloth to cover the lower parts of their body, but only one cloth to cover the upper parts of their body. And that was back in the days when you always went around with two pieces of cloth around you. One wrapped around your waist, the other over your shoulders. Because they only had one shoulder cloth between them, they'd have to leave the house at separate times. If one was going out, the other one had to stay at home. They were that poor. One night they heard that the Buddha was going to be giving a talk. So the husband was the one to go. And the talk was basically on the topic of generosity, and the Buddha talked about all the rewards of generosity. And the husband kept sitting there thinking, this is why I'm so poor. I haven't been generous. What have I got to give? I have nothing. All I have is this one cloth. And if I give this, then I won't be able to go anywhere. But if I don't give this, what can I give? I'm not going to be able to give anything at all. So he battled back and forth, back and forth, back and forth in his mind for hours. And the Buddha, noting what was going on, just kept on talking, talking, talking. It was originally supposed to be a short Dharma talk, but went on and on and on to midnight. The king was in the audience, lots of people were in the audience. They're wondering why the Dharma talk was going on so long. Finally, around midnight, the man stood up saying, Victory! Victory! He had overcome his stinginess. He was going to give the cloth to the Buddha. So he went down and gave the cloth. The people in the audience found out about the man, his poverty and his generosity. They were very impressed. And the king said, OK, I'll give him another cloth and other things in addition. A cloth and a, and a horse and an elephant, all kinds of stuff, one of each. And the man was on a roll, so he gave all those things to the Buddha. So the king upped the ante, gave him two of each. The man gave all of that, all of that kept doubling, four, eight, one, sixteen. And at the point, the man decided to keep eight of each of these things, eight pieces of gold, eight pieces of silver, eight cloths, pieces of cloth, eight horses, eight elephants, and gave the eight, other eight to the Buddha, and went home with the other remaining eight. The idea being that a small gift by a person of little means means many times means a lot more in terms of the rewards than a large gift with some, from someone who has large means. Because the first gift requires more of a sacrifice. The same principle applies in the meditation. When things aren't going well, you have to make a sacrifice of your pride, make a sacrifice of your ideas of what you would like things to be like in your, in your mind and get down to dealing with what you've got. But once you're able to make that sacrifice, then the rewards come. In the beginning, they may not be all that impressive. You may not get a piece of gold or a piece of silver or whatever, but you do get a step, a change in the mind, much better than just sitting around being discouraged. So whatever the issues are that you're facing in your meditation, be content to deal with those issues, because those are the real issues. The genuine issues you've got to face. They may not stack up against the things you've read about or the things you've experienced in the past, but solid progress is much more valuable than the flashy stuff. And John Fuang had students who would come and sit with him and meditate for the first time and gain visions of this, that, and the other things, see visions of the past life. And a lot of his students were felt discouraged by that. Here they've been sitting around meditating for months, and this person comes in and has all kinds of interesting things going in the meditation. And it often happened, though, is that people like, like that didn't stay very long. When the vision stopped, when no more entertainment, they left. It's the steady progress that makes all the difference. That turns out to be the winner in the end. 
So sacrifice whatever attitudes you may have that get in the way of looking at the issues that are staring you right in the face, because those are the ones that are genuine. They're right here. They're not abstractions. We can sit around and think about abstractions from dawn to dusk and dusk to dawn. But the problems in the mind are not composed of abstractions, and they're not composed of memories. They're composed of movements in the mind right now. Look at what the mind is doing, how it moves. Can you change the way it moves? You've got to poke around in what's actually going on in your mind to see which parts of the, the present are made of elastic and which parts are made of steel. In other words, the things you can change and the things you can't. And there's drudgery work and there's mistakes that you make, but it's this, this is the kind of knowledge that really makes a difference in the mind, because this is how you develop your sensitivity, how you get a sense of how to balance excess of desire with lack of desire, how to, exal to balance excess of effort with lack of effort, and all the other balancing acts that need to be done in the meditation. It comes from falling down and picking yourself back up again. And not talk, thinking about that, the ideal of balance, but actually getting a, an intuitive feel for it by poking at this, poking at that, whatever the attitude that's coming up in the mind, the discouragement, whatever, poke at it. You don't necessarily have to believe it. And whatever positive attitudes come up in the mind, no matter how small they may seem, that's what you've got to work with. After all, breadwood trees come from tiny seeds. You just walk on them, step on them, and they never have a chance to grow. But it's through looking carefully that you can see them, see that they're different from weed seeds. And that gives you an idea of what you've got to encourage and what you've got to discourage in the mind, what you've got to cultivate and what you've got to cut out, uproot. So it may not be glamorous and it may not be flashy, but this is how all genuine work is done in this world, bit by bit by bit, paying careful attention. That's the sort of work that gets solid results, the results that build on good, solid foundations. So you take the stairway and it does ultimately get you up to the top floor with no danger of crashing down.